If you have your Bibles with you, you might want to turn to Romans, the sixth chapter. And we will be looking at verses 17 and 18 in particular of this chapter. Where Paul writes, But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became servants of righteousness. <clears throat> Paul points out several aspects in this verse that we want to consider this morning and again this afternoon, Lord willing. But first, he, he sets forth the state of sinners. They were the servants of sin. Those who are servants of sin, that's their state. That is the state of the sinner. A slave, literally, is the word that's translated servant here. That sin is a king over them. A vicious, raging king. And the sinner, in reality, is a cowardly slave to his desires, Satan's desires, and sin's desires. The slave, or he is a slave to Satan, and also his own desires. Because sin begins in the heart of man and develops within that lust that he has. And when that lust conceives, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it's finished, brings forth death. James tells us in James, the first chapter. And so he is a slave to his own desires, his own wishes. In Romans 6 and verse 16, Paul would mention that, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey? His servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. We are the servants, the slaves of either Satan or we are the slave of God. However we yield our bodies, whichever one we yield to, that's who we are the slave of. When we yield ourselves unto sin, those lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, as John describes in 1 John 2, verse 15 through 17, then we are the slave of Satan and of sin. When we live according to that way, when we yield our bodies according to those desires of the body and the desires of Satan, we become his slave. We don't have the courage to take a stand and to reject those ways. Or we can reject those ways and we can become the servant of righteousness. Yielding our bodies to righteousness. Yielding our members. And look at verse 13 of our text. Where it says, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So there we are yielding our members, our body, our physical body, and the members of that body, we're either yielding it to sin and to Satan, or we're yielding it unto righteousness and thus unto God. We're either living according to our own desires and thus Satan's ways, or we're going to live according to God's desires and God's ways. Skip down a few verses here in Romans 6. And in verse 19, he says, I speak after the manner of men, because of the infirmity of your flesh, as 
uh, for as ye yield your members servants to uncleanness and un iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. The members of our body, instruments of either unrighteousness and thus to sin and the Satan, or we are members of Christ and yielding our members as instruments to His will, and thus righteousness. But that sinner is that one who is living after his own way and his own will. As one put it, the eyes see evil things. He hears evil things. His tongue speaks evil things. His hands work mischief. His feet follow forbidden paths. That's the state of that one who is in sin. And in reality, all men are in that state at one time or another. What we begin learning in Genesis, the third chapter, when Adam and Eve committed sin, they were separated from God. One sin, and they were separated from God. When we are born into this world, we are born without sin. We come to that point where we choose evil instead of choosing right. And we have an understanding within our minds of that choice that we make. And we have the ability thus to choose right or to choose wrong. And we choose that which is wrong. We choose the way of sin. And when we commit that first sin, we then are separated from God. As Isaiah would write of the Israel of old, your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not sin. Isaiah 59 and verse 2. And thus that sin separates us from God. And that's why Paul can say, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 3 and verse 23. Because everyone reach, who reaches that age of accountability, that age of understanding, commits sin. And thus they are separated from God. They go into that state of being a sinner. And they need salvation. Paul here within this context tells us the obedience thus that they need to render. It is to that form of teaching or that form of doctrine. If you can think of a mold and you have a mold there and metal being poured into that mold. And that metal, hot at this time, runs out and it then starts conforming to the mold. And then after it cools off, you can take that mold apart and the metal will have conformed itself to every aspect that was a part of that mold or that form or that pattern. The teaching is that mold, it's that pattern, it's that form that we as hearers are to conform ourselves to. And we thus conform our lives to that pattern of teaching, that pattern of doctrine that's found within the pages of the New Testament in particular. But when we get down to that specifics, what is that doctrine? Paul is able to define it for us in 1 Corinthians 15th chapter and verses 1 through verse 8. There he writes, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preach unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, 
by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preach unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered, now stop for just a second, at that word delivered, and go back to Romans 6 and verse 17 and verse 18. God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was, we come to this exact same word, delivered you. Paul is saying, here's this form of doctrine that was delivered to you. Paul then over here in 1 Corinthians 15 is saying, here's what I delivered to you. It's the same word and has the same meaning. It is dealing with what Paul is saying, you obey a form of this, here's what it is now. Now what is it? Well, going back Again, starting in verse 3 of 1 Corinthians 15. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried, and that He rose again the third day according to the Scriptures, and that He was seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. After that He was seen of, about, of above five hundred brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that He was seen of James, then of all the, <coughs> then of all the apostles. And last of all, He was seen of me also, as one born out of due time. Paul says, here's what I delivered unto you and that you must obey a form of this doctrine that I delivered. What is it? How that Christ died for our sins. Second, how that He was buried. Third, how that He rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. And fourth, how that He has been seen. Notice the emphasis in verses 5 through verse 8. And the repetition of this word, he was seen. Seen of Cephas, then of the twelve. Seen of about five hundred brethren at once. After that he was seen of James, then of all the apostles. Last of all, he was seen of me also. A lot of times we eliminate that aspect that Christ was seen. There's evidence, that obviously, that Paul is setting forth for the resurrection, that Christ was bodily raised. He was seen all of these times and by all of these different people and giving evidence thus to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That He was raised. A death, well, that's common to all men, isn't it? We are all going to die. The fact that he was buried, well, that's pretty common to most men. Some people, uh, let's face it, they get killed in uh, a battle during the ocean. They're buried at sea. They're not buried at, you know, on the ground. Some, through their traditions, burned people, cremated, instead of burying. And you have different things, but burial is a rather common aspect of man. But when you get over here to he was raised, now then that's pretty uncommon, isn't it? That's not something that takes place every day. Whereas these other things, yes, they do. But that he was raised from the dead, that's an unusual situation. Are you sure that he was really raised? Did you just imagine it? No, he was seen by all of these different individuals on different occasions. And thus, that is an important in establishing that resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now then, when we come back to Romans 16 and verse 17 and 18, Ye have obeyed from the heart that form, that pattern, that mold 
of that doctrine that was delivered. And that doctrine that was delivered was how that Christ died, that he was buried, that he rose again, and that he was seen. Now, we obey a form of that. <clears throat> well, what is that form? Well, we find, let's look at the death of Christ to begin with. Where's the form of that death of Christ? Well, when we turn back to Romans, the sixth chapter, as we begin this chapter, back in verse uh, 3, for example, Paul would write, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Well, there's the death of Christ that he's talking about, and we are baptized into that death. There's that form of the death of Christ. If you skip down to verse 6, <coughs> knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Christ, in his death, he died upon that cross of Calvary. It was a crucifixion that took place. A Roman style of execution, usually reserved for the lowest of individuals, the lowest of sinners. Roman uh, citizen was exempt from that type of a death, in fact, because it was so horrific. Jesus died on that cross. He was crucified. And so now then, Paul is saying, we're obeying a form of that. What is it? A crucifixion, where we die with Christ, not in a physical upon a tree, but instead in that watery grave of baptism. We're crucified with Christ. We're baptized into his death. We're dying to that old man of sin, that old life that we've lived. That is going away. That is, we're dying to it. It ceases to be us because we're dying to that lust, that desire, that lifestyle. That's why Paul would write in Galatians 2 and verse 20, I am crucified with Christ, he says. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. Crucified with Christ is what Paul says, I am. I no longer live. As far as myself and my desires, it's... Christ living in me. Why? Because I've died to that old life. I've died to that man of sin. Later in that same book, Galatians 5th chapter, and verse 24, he says, And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. See, there's the death to that affections, and lust of the flesh. Or as again John describes it, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. That's dead now. I no longer live that way. Why? Because now then it is Christ living in me. But we'll get to that in just a second. And so that Form begins with that death of Christ, which is seen in that act of baptism. But then he makes mention how that Christ was buried. Now Christ's burial was in a new tomb. A new tomb is one that had not been used before. There were not bodies already that uh, had decayed in that tomb. There were no bodies there. And so Jesus was laid in a tomb that was empty. There were no, had never been a, a body laid there. No bones that were there. It was owned by Joseph of Arimathea. That becomes important because 
if there had been bones that remained there, those Jews in wanting to destroy Christianity could have said, oh no, he wasn't raised. His body, there's still bones in that grave over there. Those bones are his. They couldn't say that because they're not any. So he was buried in a new tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. When that act of baptism, we are also buried with Christ. Again, going back to Romans 6 chapter and verse 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We've been buried with Christ. Even as Christ was buried, so we are buried, but it's in that watery grave of baptism that we're buried. But then Christ was raised from the dead. The resurrection of Christ. That he, uh, he did not remain in that tomb. And while his physical body went to the tomb, his spirit went into that Hadean realm of paradise. But his, he did not remain in paradise and his body did not remain in the grave. He was raised from the grave on that first day of the week. Well, going back to Romans 6 and verse 4 again. Why he talks about we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father. We are raised up from the dead. There is a resurrection that takes place with Christ in that act of baptism. In Colossians 2nd chapter and verse uh, 12, Paul would write, buried with him in <coughs> buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through faith of the operation of God who raised him from the dead. Even as Christ was raised from the dead, so in that act of baptism, we must be raised from the dead. The death in that water grave of baptism is the death of that old life, that old way of sin. The living for self, the living for Satan, the giving in to the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. It is that type of lifestyle that is separate and apart from God. A living a life of ungodliness. We've died to that. We're buried with him in baptism, but then we're raised. Raised for what? To be seen an appearance in new life. We emphasize there in 1 Corinthians 15 how that he was seen, Christ was of Cephas, of the twelve. He was seen of above 500 brethren at once. The greater part, he says, remain unto this present, but some are fallen asleep. After that, he was seen of Cephas, then of the, all, the, uh, all of the apostles. <coughs> And last of all, he says, he was seen of me also as one who was born out of due time. Jesus was raised up from the dead to be seen by others, confirming for us the resurrection of Jesus Christ, an, appear <coughs> an appearance of a new life. We likewise, in that water grave of baptism, are raised to walk a new life. Notice again Romans 6 chapter. And as we begin in verse 3, And know ye not 
that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism <coughs> into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, <coughs> even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, well, that took place in baptism. And we're being planted together in the likeness, the form, that figure of death, of Christ's death. <coughs> we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So even as we in that act of baptism, we die to that old man of sin, we're raised like as Christ was raised, and like as Christ having a new life, so we will have a new life. Skip down again to verse 8 of Romans 6. Now if we be dead with Christ, what is that? That's when we were baptized. And in that watery grave of baptism, we die. We're dead with Christ. We believe that we shall also live with Him. Now then, going back to what Paul wrote there in Galatians 2 and verse 20 about, <coughs> I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life that I now live in the in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. What is it? If we die with Christ, we shall also live with him. Paul could write to the Philippian brethren that whether in life or death, Christ would be magnified in his body. And thus he could say that for me death is gain. But to live in the flesh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to glorify God. I'm going to live for Him. And thus for me to live, he says in chapter 1 and verse 21 of Philippians, for me to live is Christ. To the Colossian brethren in the first chapter, he would tell them, Christ in you, the hope of glory. It's Christ living in us so that as people see us, they see a changed individual. No longer living the way that we used to live, now then, it's Christ in us. They see Christ living in us. Now, Lord willing, this afternoon we're going to continue with the, for noticing the spirit of acceptable obedience because this is our obedience in being baptized to die to that old man of sin, buried with him in that act of baptism, then raised up out of that watery grave of baptism to walk that new life of now living for Christ and allowing Christ to live in you. If you've not obeyed that gospel, we would encourage you this morning to be obedient to it. And then to live for Him. Live your life in accordance with His will, allowing Christ to live in you. And if you haven't lived that way as a child of God, then repent of your sins and let us pray with you for the forgiveness of it. If we can help you in this way, won't you come as we stand and sing the invitation song?